Um, so I didn't write any notes for today, actually, because, you know, as I got up 4 a.m., heading towards the train in New York, catch the Amtrak, I just kept saying to myself, like, this should be called a common sense briefing, <laughs> right? Because to me, this just makes so much uh, sense. Um, first of all, thank you to Congresswoman uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson for creating this opportunity, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my new organization, Just Leadership USA, has a goal of cutting the number of people in prison in the United States in half by 2030. And so any opportunity I get to talk about uh, what we call alternative to incarceration, um, although I even think that that terminology ties us into the idea that prison is the first option and then perhaps we should find an alternative as opposed to changing the whole paradigm, which is where I hope we end up shortly here in the United States. But any opportunity I get to promote uh, things like this, I'm here. Because why? Because I've seen it work. Um, and because I've seen the damage that prison causes to individuals and families and entire communities. Uh, in fact, a big part of my motivation for doing this work after exiting prison, uh, after serving six years in New York, um, was not just my own experience, but actually more so what I witnessed you know, on the inside in terms of how many uh, young men of color in particular, uh, black men, Latino men, um, who were it not for our harsh drug laws, um, clearly would have been uh, doing some amazing things uh, for this country and clearly that human capital is being wasted um, as a result of uh, all of these laws that we've put in place over the years. So it's good to see that we're having a discussion, um, particularly here in D.C., about the idea of coming up with alternatives for some of these things that we know uh, doesn't work based on all the research. Um, so, so I want to talk a bit from professional perspective, a bit from personal perspective. Um, I, have a, I have two sons, uh, one's 24, one's three and a half, uh, Chad and Joshua. And uh, during my time in prison, the six years that I served, um, Forget about the federal level, where people literally leave the state and end up in many different places around the country. I mean, I was eight hours from New York City, mm -hmm. yet when you're eight hours away, right, it's an eight-hour bus trip in one direction, eight hours sitting in the visiting room, and then eight hours coming back. So it's not really eight hours, it's 24 hours, and then some. And I, I felt that it was incumbent upon me, actually, to tell the, uh, my child's mother and my son that they didn't have to go do that. That was my decision, that it was just too much for them to be here which further separated me from my older son. And I feel the impact of that today. Uh, there's such a difference between my relationship with my older son, Chad, and my younger son, Joshua, and anyone who's connected to me on social media and so on can actually see the difference because we were almost never able to mend the fissure that was created as a result of me not being in his life. And yet this happens every single day in this country to millions of people based on the numbers that we're talking about. And again, it's, it's not, so it's a, it's a system that disproportionately impacts people of color, disproportionately impacts poor people, but in the end, it's an American problem. Like, we all pay the price for these policy decisions that we've made over the last uh, four decades or so. And the price that we pay uh, lasts well beyond when a person exits the prison gates. I know that if, um, so I remember coming home myself and owing uh, $53,000 in child support arrears that accumulated while I was in prison and having $43,000 or so in fines, fees, and restitution and having a job paying $16,000 per year. You do the math. Um, most people would give up right at that moment. Um, but imagine what situation that also created between myself and the mother of my child and what assumptions I made about what her role was in, you know, in even creating that situation, whether it was true or not. We have a lot of laws on the books that create uh, automatic uh, um, uh, bills like child support um, these days. And yet, those things, unfortunately, don't bring families together. They split families apart. And so when I landed uh, back home, I landed at a law firm called the Legal Action Center in New York and became a paralegal ultimately and started talking to thousands of people with criminal records who were exiting the system. And it became clear to me that the narrative that we have about uh, young men of color not uh, playing the role of being parents is just not true. Uh, I mean, so many people were calling me who actually were trying their hardest to be good parents and were coming up against bureaucratic red tape and uh, uh, statutes that got in the way of them being a good parent and, and practices and administrative practices and so on. 
And it just became abundantly clear to me that these people were actually trying everything they could do to be good parents. And, and then I landed at the Fortune Society, uh, an organization similar to uh, where uh, the organization Liz runs. And there's a family services program there where, again, uh, it was reinforced for me, not just that many of the young men and women who were in that program wanted to try their best to be good parents. We had a family services program that served a couple hundred people each year. But also I had a chance to engage with family members of people who have um, served time. And just increasingly, you know, I was able to divorce myself from my own sort of anecdotal experience, my personal experience, and realize that, again, across the board for the most part, that people who had served time wanted to reconnect with their families, and people who were the family members of those folks wanted to reconnect with the people who had served time. So here we are having a discussion about the potential for uh, uh, diverging from uh, sentencing guidelines and giving people opportunities for, for diversion. And we're talking about non-violent drug offenders. When I was at the Fortune Society, to be quite frank, we actually would target people with even more serious crimes. Um, and it worked well. Like I've seen people with serious crimes be diverted out of the system and land in the community and have their needs met. Um, and in six months to a year, at a fraction of the cost of locking them up, uh, they come out being very productive uh, citizens and uh, tax-paying citizens and all the other rhetoric um, that we tend to use when we talk about this stuff. Although in the end, we're really trying to, in my mind, build stronger families. And that's what usually comes out of these alternative incarceration programs. Um, and, you know, Nikichi sort of set the tone in the beginning, um, but I think it's incumbent for me to say out loud, like, we have been practicing uh, diversion in the United States, but our most successful diversion program in the United States is white skin and wealth. And we've been doing it for a really long time. And so the type of crimes people are charged with that we're talking about diverting them for, we can successfully do it in the community and uh, protect public safety and strengthen families. Um, so I hate to sort of talk to you guys and sound as if I'm uh, talking about this stuff as if it's hugely common sense and easy to do. I get that it's not easy to do. I get that it's going to take a while for America to sort of turn this mistake around. But at the same time, I had a hard time thinking about uh, writing a presentation here that included a ton of data and research and evidence because um, this is the low-hanging fruit. And this is something that we should um, be doing to set the pace for the longer-term goals of uh, uh, undoing this system of mass incarceration that we've created in the United States. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.